Let me just say something at the outset. Um, I had thought I would go to that podium and read a prepared speech, which I rarely do, but this was an auspicious occasion. And then I saw Kevin come on stage early. <laughs> and I thought, this is the kind of occasion in which we can have, even in this large hall, a kind of conversation about America. Let me begin by saying, if there's an oxymoron in American life, it is the phrase, humble anchorman. We don't exist. <laughs> but the fact is that seeing these young scholars walk on this stage tonight was truly a humbling experience for me, as I'm sure it was for everyone in this room, for a variety of reasons. First of all, to know that they had competed for one of the most difficult competitions in American scholarship and had won. And then as I watched them walk on, young men and young women representing this immigrant nation, and we are still that. Everyone in this room, their families came from elsewhere over the years, over the centuries for that matter. But now in the 21st century, we have never had in a gathering like this, as much diversity as we do now. We had young people of every ethnic origin, from every corner of America. We had both genders as well, aspirations that run the gamut, everything from education to engineering, to law, to astrophysics, and they are our future. So I'd like to begin tonight, if I can, by just addressing these young people. And my speech will really begin with a plea, a plea for help, because we need you sooner rather than later. Now, you may wonder at this stage in your lives, am I up to this? Do I know what I need to know? That's not the important question. The important question is, you're expected to know and to want to know. And for that, we are very grateful. Now, you may look at me as someone who's been at a fairly senior position in my profession for a long, long time, and think maybe that I began my academic career the same way you did. I couldn't have qualified for one of these Coca-Cola scholarships. <laughs> I did come out of high school kind of a whiz kid. But then I went seriously off the rails for a couple of years until Meredith pulled me back. <laughs> Woody Allen says that 90% of life is showing up. I was in the other 10% my first two years. <laughs> but I had a very wise professor. I was a political science major. I was already working in journalism. And he encouraged me to just drop out of school for a couple of months and get it out of my system. And so I did, and I came crawling back. And I repaired myself. I didn't graduate with distinction, but I did get my degree. And then I went on to achieve a certain amount of success in the field of broadcast journalism and in writing. And then I began to get some honors. Washington University in St. Louis decided to give me an honorary degree. It's a very fine institution. And they called my professor. Bill Farber was his name. And they said, we'd like to know a little more about Tom Brokaw's undergraduate years because we're feeling very thrilled that we can give him an honorary degree. And my old professor said to him very quickly, well, frankly, we always thought the degree we gave him here was an honorary degree. <laughs> so I say to you young people, there may come a time when you may stumble in the next few years. College may be an overwhelming experience when you go from wherever you were raised to one of the elite universities in America and have a little trouble finding your way. But you'll persevere because of your preparation and the choice that Coca-Cola and the foundation made in giving you the scholarship was not just about academics alone, it was about your essential character. And it is that essential character that we're all counting on to help us make America preeminent again, not just in the world, but here at home. 
I need not remind this audience that this has been an unsettling week in our country. It's been an unsettling season. We've had an outbreak of mass violence perpetrated by mad gunmen. We've had a bombing at one of our most joyous and celebrated sporting events, the Boston Marathon. And it comes at a time when we seem to have difficulty as a society in finding common ground, in getting our footing to deal with the challenges that we know that are before us. So I would like to suggest to the Coca-Cola scholars who are here tonight that we need your help beginning now. And here's how you can help us. You can enter whatever university or college that you have chosen with your own career very much in mind, and it may change in the course of the next four years or in the course of graduate years. But here's what you cannot forget is that you're elite in this society and that we are counting on you to take your place in great corporations, in the academy, in hospitals, and in laboratories. And while you're going off to college, a peaceful environment, you're expected to do nothing more than learn all that you possibly can. Other young people your age most of them from working-class families. Even tonight, in Afghanistan and in other parts of the world, are putting on Kevlar vests, helmets, locking and loading weapons, and going out to face an unseen enemy in hostile territory. They are our fellow citizens. They're all volunteers. Most of them come from working-class families. They represent less than 1% of our population. And yet, in fighting the two longest wars in America's history, they have received far too little recognition. Their families have lived at home with the emotional turmoil that the phone may ring at any moment with the unbearable news of a death or grievous wounds or emotional trauma of some kind. That is not just unjust in a democratic society. That's really immoral. And you young Coca-Cola scholars can help change the course of our country by, from the very beginning of your collegiate career, by virtue of the jump start that you've got with the Coca-Cola scholarship. Make an early commitment, beginning tonight, that an unalloyed and continuing part of your life will be public service. That you'll always find a way to give back to your country while simultaneously pursuing your personal career and your personal ambitions. That you'll begin college not just as a freshman student, but as a full-blown citizen. At the age of 18, you're eligible to vote, and you can join military services, but it doesn't end there. You must also make a commitment to your country and to the common bond that has always made this country unique in the world, that we come to this precious piece of geography from all corners of the earth with the American dream in mind that every generation will have a better and more quality life than the preceding one. But that means that we have to fulfill the obligations of citizenship to that common good every day as well. And I know you can do it because I have been witness to what you've accomplished already. I have watched you adapt to and adopt the most transformative technology in the history of mankind, the information technology. In fact, in this audience right now, I will say to the older folks here, I promise you, there is someone who is a Coca-Cola scholar out there right now on a PDA of some kind tweeting, Brokaw speaking to Coca-Cola scholarship dinner, hashtag old dude.
But that technology alone will not advance the common interest of this country. It may be useful to you in doing some research for a paper or finding the next Best Buy and a song that you care about or a book that you want. You may be able to connect to your friends to make a coffee date or a, a weekend at a movie of some kind. But it goes far beyond that. That technology has made this world a much smaller place, more interconnected, and the challenges, therefore, of how we fit into that world are simultaneously greater. It will do us little good to Twitter, to text, to email, to wire the world if we short circuit our souls. So we must use that new technology wisely to advance the common good as well. And that is already underway in so many forms. I suspect that some of you learned about the Coca-Cola Scholarship probably by going on the internet. You'll be in touch, not just with friends, but with strangers in far off places. Those of you who go into medicine or health services will be able to share your knowledge in emerging markets in the far corners of the world. And constantly think of it as a precious new tool, not just as a distraction or a means to find a friend in a Starbucks coffee place. That's the challenge of your generation. Moreover, there's another challenge for your generation. As I watched the students come in here tonight, I thought back on my time when I was growing up. First of all, the complexion of everyone would have been one shade, for the most part. There would have been more young men than women by a factor of about five to one. One of the profound changes of this century will be, at the end of it, this is going to be the century of women. There has never been as much progress made by that gender, and rightfully so, as there has been just in the last 25 or 30 years. Stop and think about it. The other day, they named a woman the head of the Secret Service. Half the Ivy League presidents are women. More than half the students at, at uh, medical schools, law colleges, are all women. The head of Xerox is an African-American woman. The most powerful woman and one of the most powerful people in the country right now is Sheryl Sandberg, who is the head of Facebook, Silicon Valley. So this is going to be a century of women taking their place beside men in every aspect of society, and thank God for that, because we need everyone in the arena and making a contribution to who we want to become. And what we want to become is an increasingly tolerant society one that is able to work together to find common cause. We are not witness to that now. In all the years I've been a journalist, more than a half a century at this point, frankly, I have never seen the country so fractured or divided within the Beltway, in the institutions of government. And then I come to Atlanta, or last week I was in Indiana, in a similar kind of gathering, and I see from the ground up the definition of the real America. No one in this room tonight watched those students come on stage, thrilled to be a Coca-Cola scholar, and was able to say, that one's a member of the Tea Party, that one's from a blue state, that one's from a red state. They were all Americans, and they were our future, marching across the stage and into our midst and so we ask them now for our help. And we ask them to lower the temperature of the division that has gotten us to where we are. So as you use this new technology, keep a couple things in mind. No tweet, no text, no email will ever replace a first kiss. You can't hold hands with your iPhone. I don't ever want to hear a song 
that goes, a tweet is just a tweet as time goes by. <laughs> and no text message will ever replace a whispered, I love you, I would like to spend the rest of my life with you. Now my friend Maria Shriver, talking to this generation, all has another thought. In using this astonishing new technology, be prepared to use the pause button from time to time. Pause before you send a remark that could be offensive to someone, before you send an insensitive joke, before you mock someone who is in your circle or not even in your circle, or mock another person of some kind. And not be afraid to stand up and say to your circle of friends, however uncomfortable it may be, that's going too far. Because we not only have to find common ground, the challenge of this 21st century is to find higher ground in America. I'm confident that you can do just that. And one of the ways that you can do it is to leave here tonight with a personal commitment to go with your gratitude about being a Coca-Cola scholar that for the rest of your life, in one form or another, you'll find a way to give back to your country. You'll find a way to reach across class and socioeconomic lines, especially to military families and the veterans who are coming home, and say not just thank you, but how can I help? How can I help you realize the American dream? And that American dream in your hands can become not just about having more cars, larger houses, fancier vacations. It can be about improving the quality of life for all future generations, for making us a more just and tolerant society, for using the extraordinary skills that you have to advance not your, just your personal interest, but the interests of your community and your state and your nation. That would be my hope for you. I have no doubt that you're capable of doing all this. Watching you just come into this arena tonight with a smile and the sense of achievement that was in the expressions of all of you gave me a lift that I'll carry out of this hall and into my life for the rest of this year and beyond. And let me say to the sponsors who are here tonight and those of you who are simply coming to show your support, thank you. Thank you for that because you are fulfilling your role as citizens as well. Finally, to the scholars, let me say one additional thing. At a graduation at the University of Virginia a few years ago, I said, remember this, it's easy to make a buck. It's tough to make a difference. And when I finished, I walked back, and one of the fathers of the students who was a Wall Street guy came up to me and he said, I'd like to change that line. I said, how would you change it? He said, it's tough to make a buck, but if you make a lot of bucks, you can make a hell of a difference. So tonight I leave you with a choice. Make a lot of, lot of bucks that make a hell of a difference. Or remember, it's tough to make a difference and easier to make a buck. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. I'm at an age and stage in my life when these are the kinds of evenings that give me eternal hope that I know that this remains an exceptional nation because it produces exceptional people from the bottom up and from the bottom of my heart. Thank you all and Godspeed. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna begin by asking you to give the scholarship winners a quick little piece of advice uh, and pragmatic. They're gonna be going to college in the fall. You all went through that experience and sometimes it can be a little daunting. You know, it's going through the knot hole in a way. You're going from being a big star in high school to the competition is a lot tougher. 
What's the most important thing that they should know, Jamie, when they enter college about how to adapt to it? I actually have this conversation with my students all the time. I teach 11th and 12th grade students in North Carolina. And one of the things that I tell them is when they go to college, they should do things that they are passionate about. They should do things because they want to. They should do things that come from a deep conviction uh, in terms of their extracurricular involvements, even in terms of what they're doing in class, their studies. Uh, many times I have students who are so interested in adding things to their resume because they feel like that's gonna get them the best job. But for me, and, and I tell them this, what separates them and what will separate them in college and in their careers is that they do, they do things, they do things to help other people from a place of conviction and a place of passion. Kate? And I would, I would piggyback on that and say uh, from a place of authenticity. Um, and that's not a word that you think of when you're in high school, authenticity. <laughs> you know, you want to make your parents proud. You want to get a good paying job to help pay off student loans. Mm -hmm. And yes, you want to do good. Um, but beyond that, everything else seems so big and complicated and nerve wracking. I would say that to try to, as Steve Jobs said, you know, drown out all the other voices and to truly find out who you are, who you are, who you are, not who anyone else wants you to be. That's right. Ryan, uh, you're in a position to see how the rest of the world operates. Uh, we sometimes become a little provincial in this great country of ours. We think that the whole world should march to our rhythm. How important has it been for you to see the world from outside America looking back? Uh, it's been very interesting. I'm from a small town in Maine. Uh, not the most, well, it's about as provincial as you can get, actually. And I, I would say um, it kind of goes both ways. As you said, when I look around this room, I see the United Nations here. Uh, and I think that that may be changing a little bit, that there are, nowadays, uh, young people are exposed to a lot more cultures and a lot more um, outside you know, perspectives uh, just from their friends and from their friends' families. Mm -hmm. About 75% of the scholars' uh, applications that I read talked about, the individual scholars talked about their identities as uh, you know, members of immigrant families. Mm -hmm. So I think that is changing. I think that one of the things that I've learned um, in my career is that we as Americans come with the assumption that you know, we're the good guys on the block uh, and that people see us that way. And I think that it has been uh, encouraging to me when we're able to uh, be a little bit more modest about our place, you know, in the, in the family of nations, frankly, and that we have a lot to learn ourselves. You know, this evening is uh, kind of reasonably unique in American corporate history. American corporations have always been generous, but there is a much higher level of social consciousness now within the corporate world. And yet, the so-called millennial generation, young people who are coming of age, have some pretty good reason to be skeptical about relationships with big corporations because what they've seen their parents go through in the last several years, a lot of people have lost their jobs, companies have shut down plants and moved them to other parts of the world. What about relationships okay, with corporations, and what is it that corporations should know about this generation that is coming of age now, and how to make them closer in how they go through life together? More flexibility? Definitely. You talked about women uh, in your speech, about Sheryl Sandberg. Um, I was on a four-hour delay from Chicago today and was reading her book, Lean In, and um, the concept of what women want in corporate America is changing. And I think that flexibility is certainly one of them, but I think when you think about corporate America and connecting with the young men and women that are in this room, it's going to be up to them to have their voice heard and to realize that they are an important group and to really speak who they are and to truly make a difference and connect with that corporation as well. And Jamie, are you finding in your young students a greater appetite for public service, an idea of what that means even? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, many of my students are, part of it is a requirement in the summer that they have to do 
voluntary service for, for graduation requirement. But even the students who are not required to do that do it anyway. And many of them go beyond the 60 hours that they have to do. So I, I think they're very open and, and many of the students aren't doing it because they want to improve their chances of getting into the right schools. So I see it, with technology, as you, as you talked about, it is, it is helping our students become a lot more globally aware and aware of people who are less fortunate than themselves and, and, and they see a need and they, they're trying to serve or, or fulfill that need. Ryan, you do work in a field of public service uh, representing the United States in distant places. Um, do you have trouble finding the right kind of people who want to follow you in your footsteps, would like to do that kind of work? Because I know, having been there and watched the AID workers in the field, it's not easy. People are knocking down our doors to try to work for us. I think that there is, it's a matter of budget, it's a matter of priorities, but Recently, as you mentioned in your book, um, the number of our foreign service officers has recently doubled under um, former Secretary Clinton. And I find that, you know, I actually get calls about once a month from former or from current and former Koch scholars asking, how do I do what you do? Uh, you know, the, the good news is that the United States government is just in the position of opening doors. There are a lot of nonprofit organizations, as well as corporations, including Coca-Cola. I think um, Mark mentioned some of the international work that uh, Coke does, some of it in partnership with my agency. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, uh, very, quite a few, uh, or I should say a, a fairly narrow uh, number of them within the government, but a lot more um, partnerships that are out there where people can actually make a difference. And they don't have the visibility that they ought to have, probably, to the general population. Well, I, so USAID was mentioned three times in chapter 10 of your book, so <laughs> I'm, I'm a Koch scholar, so I did my homework. I see. Um, and I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, the, it, my agency was created at the same time as the Peace Corps. So we're celebrating our, or recently celebrated our 50th anniversary in a lot of countries where we've been working. Um, but I think that, you know, diplomacy and defense tend to take people's attention, but development is an incredibly important part of the United States' uh, work overseas. You're an expert in conflict resolution. That's right. Could we get you to go to the United States Senate tomorrow morning? <laughs> <laughs> well, all I would say is in sort of the, I, I work in Washington, so I'm used to sort of having to dodge and we, <laughs> we work for the people of the United States and so do they. Um, I have the, the uh, privilege of being a civil servant, which means that I don't have to get involved in politics. Mm. And so, um, but on the other hand, I'm a citizen. And that means that I, there's a mutual accountability that, uh, and, a, and, a, and Jimmy, a loop that goes there. You're in the lifeblood of uh, the future of any country. You're in education. Education really is in the crosshairs at the moment. Are we doing the kind of job that we need to? Teachers are caught up in all of that. Uh, they, I think in some cases they feel like they're battered children to some degree in American society. Why should I go into education? Why should I become a high school teacher and find myself under fire from all sides? I think you go into teaching because you care about children. I think too many times adults are making decisions and adults are making decisions based on their own interests rather than considering the interests of children. I also think you go into, into teaching because you believe it's a vocation and it's a calling. It's not a job. I love what I do. And I, and I, and it, it, I wake up each morning excited to go into, into, into my classroom. So knowing that you're touching lives, knowing that you are making a difference and helping to mold, mold young people and, and helping to, to encourage them to be civically minded and, and have some civic responsibility. As I teach uh, history, it's the best job that you could have. Kate, you're a... Uh... <laughs> uh, you're a very popular anchor a person in one of the uh, great cities for journalism in America. Chicago has always been that. Uh, you're really in the cockpit there every evening covering the stories. You're also a Notre Dame graduate. 
What's tougher for you, explaining to Chicago the policies of Ron Emanuel or explaining the virtual boyfriend, girlfriend of the Notre Dame linebacker? Manti Teo. <laughs> right. How did I know Manti Teo would end up in this, right? <laughs> Good question. Um, if I could just say something, too, about teaching. Both my parents were school teachers. Great. And um, you asked, you know, how do you instill a sense of public service? Where do kids get that from, you know? The greatest generation had it from their parents. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the concept of teaching a young person and molding them and giving them the inspiration to do the same for someone else mm -hmm. and to pass it along is one of the most powerful things you can do. Mm -hmm. I think in a way journalists are teachers too because they reach out to people and tell stories that would never otherwise get told. Um, so I think at the heart of what you do and what you do, what we all do is teaching. I want to thank all of you, and I want to leave uh, our new scholars with a, a favorite phrase that came from a, a great friend of mine, a humorist by the name of Art Buckwald, who we lost a few years ago, newspaper columnist from Washington. On these kinds of occasions, he would look out at the next generation coming of age, and he would say to them, we have given you a perfect world, don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> we know it's going to be a more perfect world because we have Coca-Cola scholars like you out there in the classroom, on the air, and representing America around the world. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.